All right, uh, good morning. This is Sunday School. It is uh, the 1st of uh, March, 2020. I'm Jason Tripp. We're going to pick up again on Romans chapter number 8. And I want to answer the question today. Paul says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I hope that as we're studying through Romans chapter 8, you're committing these verses to memory. And the reason why I say that is uh, you don't always have a Bible in front of you and situations come up or, or thoughts come in your mind. And it's so helpful to have the verse already there, ready to go. When Paul says to think on these things, those things that we think about whatsoever things are true, right? The truth is what escapes the world system. The worldview says there's no truth. You can't believe that. It's whatever's good for you is fine. And, and, and we look at these scriptures and go, well, if God be for us, who can be against us? Paul's obviously already hoping that you've come to a conclusion. This is a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is just one that states a fact more so than is trying to really elicit a response. If you're sitting there having to go, hmm, who could be against us? You missed the point. You need to go back and read the, the previous you know, seven chapters to figure out that God cannot ever be against you when you are in Christ Jesus because what he has done through his son in that he has, who, who he spared not his own son, but through him and with him and by him, freely give us all things is true. So I'm going to tell you today that you're going to have a problem in, in life where you think that this couldn't be true. You're going to go, well, this, there's a situation, there's a problem, there's whatever it is, and you're going to go, could this really be the case? And so doubt is a very interesting concept because what I see in, in the scriptures of use, the usage of doubt, you know, we see Peter, we see poor old doubting Thomas. You know, I feel bad for doubt. I feel bad for Thomas. I honestly do because I think it's unfair that we always go, just, you know, you're a doubting Thomas. And it's like, yeah, but look, there was a lot of the other guys who had a lot more doubt throughout the situation. And when you're seeing God face to face, we're going to look today even at Joshua where God is for him. And still in that, they're like, I've seen battles. We've seen victories. And we're still kind of like, is he really though? And so we today possess a, a, a superior uh, ability. I, wanna, I really want to say that at the outset, a superior ability and a superior thing called the Holy Spirit that nobody else possessed at any time like we have today, okay? Meaning that we have the mind of Christ today that David did not have. Moses did not have this, okay? Those that were under the law did not possess this. Even Peter, James, and John did not have this during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not have the experience of what it means to have the mind of Christ. Because Christ was not even in existence in, on the earth yet. He was not born. While we're going to see today that there is a pre-carnate Jesus Christ who has an eternal purpose, that through his eternal purpose, we then have an eternal purpose. Because as we're going to see, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be what? Ephesians 1, Romans 8. So let's read these verses again. <clears throat> I'm going to start at verse 28. We have read through these, but I want to kind of preface where we are. 28 is not the isolation verse. You have to remember he's already kind of told you about your, 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 your deliverance from the bondage of corruption. He's already told you about the glorious liberty that you have as now being a child of God. He has told you that you've been adopted, that you no longer should be thinking of yourself as a son of who? Adam. But as a son of who? God. Romans chapter 5, he's already really explicitly told you that in Adam all die, but in, in Christ all should be made alive. He's told you that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, right? He's told you explicitly that you are 100% dead to sin and that you're freed from it. And then you're going, okay, how then does Romans 8, 28 and the rest of these verses work to that God being for us? What do you mean? Read all those verses. All those verses are God being for you. He is, he, he, God's, God's overwhelming goal for the entire world is what? Reconciliation. The justification of all men. It is God's will that what? All men be saved and then come to the knowledge of the truth. The problem is not that God 
is not capable of saving all men. Correct? The free will that we experience in life is to believe the gospel, to, be, to have that charge of you have a conscience. With your conscience, it can be pricked. It can be enlightened. And then you can choose truth. In Romans 8, 28, you should realize then that all things do work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called, and we've spent the last couple weeks discussing who that is, and, and I hope we've been clear, according to his purpose. It is those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. And just a real quick one, I know a couple people haven't been here. Those he did foreknow, people love this verse. Be, the, the, the Calvinists love it. I was actually just listening to a song on the radio as I was in here. And it was like, I did not choose you, but you chose me. And like, I'm like, wait, why this is like, and it's very Calvinistic, and it's this whole real weird, interesting thing. <clears throat> but going real quick with me to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, I was with my buddy this week, and I was giving him a computer thing that he needed. And while we were sitting there talking about the Bible, uh, I quoted this verse. I said, because, you know, in him, he hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. And he, he goes, I love him when somebody goes, what, what verse is that? And he opens his little notebook up. He goes, what verse is that? And I said, it's 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to guess it's 9. I said 9, but it was actually, I think, 10 or whatever it was when I told him. I said, just, you know, it's, it's, right, it's right there. But he got excited about this verse. Because what these verses show, and I'm just going to read this very quickly. In verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. So what I'm going to show you is that there is a, there is a progression of an adult who learns the knowledge of the truth, then teaches their child, who then in turn teaches their child, who hopefully it continues on through the progression of teaching their children's children and children's children and, and, and so on and so forth. And that doesn't mean that every single one of them were, quote unquote, they're all the chosen family in a sense, but because they understood the gospel, <coughs> Timothy, who had the scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation since his what? Since his youth? Since his childhood, I had a Wana Clubs International as my scripture as a child that was able to make me wise unto salvation, right? I thank Awana because that's partially where, you know, my parents getting involved in that and all the scripture memory verses. And that's really one of the main reasons I'm, I'm doing this today is because of how much uh, scripture was imputed to me uh, through, through Awana Clubs. But he says, it was in your grandmother Lois, and then it was in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it is in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. So if it's not according to works, if it be of works, it's no longer of grace. And if it's of grace, it's no longer of works, right? So as he writes here, it's not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. One of God's major purposes is that probably the most paramount purpose is the grace of God given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. In other words, the gospel. It is his eternal purpose, which is you're going to read, read here, which was given us, and this is really important to understand because I want you to think about this first, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world Began. We say this all the time that when God looks down from heaven, he only sees two people. He either sees those that are in Adam and dead in trespasses and sins and stuck in the condemnation, or he sees what? He sees his son. I think it took me a long time to really process what that meant. I think I heard that over and over and over and over again. And then I started to finally realize, wow, when he says the adoption, that's what he means. He has, he has made us as righteous as his own son. And in the, the view of God, he does not see, oh, I see 75% Jesus and 25% Jason Tripp in the flesh, right? Because thank God he doesn't see that because that would be really bad, right? 
He doesn't see 50% and 50% on, on, on the good day, quote unquote, right? Not really a good day. You got 90, 10, okay? Whatever it might be. I'm just saying, maybe you slept most of the day, so you didn't have as much sin. That's a joke. But he says, before the world began. You know, I, I, I've, been, I've been looking at the concept of purpose in these verses, and I really have found that so many are lacking a purpose in life, and the purpose that they're looking for will never be fulfilled in their career or their job or a relationship, but really the eternal purposes we're going to see, which was given us in Christ Jesus, hold on, it was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began? Yes. Do you not think that God had the creation of the world and all humanity in his mind when he created it? Do you think he knew who you were prior to your birth? Yes. Very interesting to think about, but he does. And I, I look at the testimony of Scripture here <clears throat> that it was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Wow, that's some real big purpose. So when you're a little kid, and I, I have kids now myself, and they're, they're getting older, and you're like, okay, you know, my son always asks me, goes, you know, I, I'm going to tell you this story. This is really interesting, okay? <clears throat> we're sitting there, we're watching this, this video at my mom's house, and it's a, it's a Disney short. I, it's a Pixar short. I, I don't know the name of it. I, I, sorry, I could tell you, but you probably Google the stuff that I'm telling you about and probably find it. It's about seven to ten minutes long, and it's me, it's Noah. So I'm sitting on the couch. So it's Noah here, me in the middle, Chloe, then my mom. We're all sitting on the couch watching this short. So we're sitting there, and the short starts, and it's this old man, and he's you know probably in his 40s, whatever. He's, I say old man, but you know, I'm almost 40 now, too. Isn't that bad? I start thinking about that. Anyways. He's, he's, about, he's about in his mid-40s, let's say, uh, and he's, he's, he's uh, waking up and the alarm clock goes off, right? And all of a sudden it goes into this mind of him and it shows this little mind and it's spinning. It shows this little heart and it starts beating. It shows his stomach and it starts – and it's really cool. I'm like, oh, that is cool. That's what happens every morning, right? Your muscles are firing. Your legs are getting going. Your hands are going. Your eyes are blinking a million times. All these little things that are kind of telling the person, okay, it's time to wake up, right? And he's doing this and the – brain snaps and the arm goes out and you know grabs the shirt and you know all these little pieces and no i think that's really funny he goes wow is that really what happens i go yeah that, that just kind of is what happens so he's going through this whole process of you know going like this and what's really cool is he gets into the shower and and you know he's he, he gets he gets dressed and he walks outside and he smells the air right and he's like hey everything's starting to get awakened and he walks over and he's he's making his way to his job and he looks over and he sees the the people playing on the beach, he sees the people getting their coffee, he sees people riding a bike, and he's kind of like getting a little sad because he's seeing all this, but then in the, in the distance is his office that he's got to go to. You know, and he's like looking at his office, and he keeps looking at the, the beach, he looks at the office, he looks at the beach, he, he's like doing this thing, and his heart's going, take me to the beach, take me to the beach, and ba Brain's like, no, 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 if you do this, and it's really weird, I'm telling you, it's a very weird little short, but it keeps showing the brain Telling the heart, no, if you do this, you don't eat, you die, and it keeps, it's like this little circle where you eat, you die, you jump into a grave, and then the little priest goes and gives them the little, you know, whatever thing. And you go, this is really weird. So I'm watching this thing intently going, this is really deep. And Noah's looking at me like this, like, what is going on, right? Chloe has no clue what's happening, but Noah's looking at me really like, this is weird. So it goes all the way to the door of, of like getting to the actual office, right? And he goes to grab it, and his heart goes like, no, and it won't let him grab the door. And the brain and the heart are having this, like, argument about who's going to grab the door and whether or not we're going to go into the office that day, right? So finally the brain wins, and he goes in, and he starts doing his work. And he's sitting there, and it's like, blah, 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 and he hits a little piece of paper, and the next piece of paper comes out, blah, 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 and hits a piece of paper, and the next piece of paper. So it's like this constant little, little cycle. So the, <clears throat> the long and the short of, the, of what, I'm, what I mean by this is that he, he's looking for this purpose – and what's really cool about, the, about the, the video and what Noah says to me is he goes, Dad, do I have to do that? And I go, wow. No, I said, no, no. He goes, I really don't want to do that, <laughs> you know? And, and I said, well, what do you – and I kind of got into his brain. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. Whatever that is, I don't want to do. And then what's cool about the whole video is, of course, at the end, his, he, he says, you know, basically, I'm done with this. I'm leaving. He jumps out and he goes out and, and goes and surfing. And then he goes and plays and he does all this stuff. And he has a lot of fun. Right. And then he eventually turns his work into fun and he turns it into something that's interesting. I won't spoil the whole, whole ending for you. But the, the, the concept of purpose in that I go, that's what the majority of people do. My buddy called me this past week and he said the exact thing. He goes. His birthday's two days after mine. I just had my birthday. And he's like, he's like, yep. So we're, you know, another year older. I go, yep. Yep, he's a Jewish guy. 
and I go, uh, so what? What now? And he's like, I don't know. He's like, it's just, is this what it's all about? Like, this is it? Like, we just, you know, my retirement's looking good until that little stock market dip, but, you know, I'm doing well. He just bought like a almost million dollar house. You know, he's doing well, made partner. And I'm like, eh, is that it? So what I'm trying to impute to you guys is like the concept of looking for an eternal purpose that far exceeds like, okay, you know, I would love for you to take over my business one day. Yeah, that'd be fun, right? So you have a little more flexibility, you have a little more freedom. But the purpose that far extends beyond that, something that's more, something that's more fulfilling. And who would know better about a purpose that would be more fulfilling for you than the one who created you? No, seriously, think about that. I want you to stop. I want you to contemplate that thought. Who knows more? about what you need than the one who created you. Oh, that's right, nobody. You can think you might know more about what you need, but you don't. So in these verses where Paul says that he hath given us in Christ Jesus before the, world, before the word began, he gave us a purpose according to his grace. He had his grace in mind in the creation of the world. But is now, as he says, made manifest. What is made manifest? This grace, this purpose in Christ Jesus, was this made manifest during the, the life of Moses? No. No. And I want you to go and read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and just go read it and, and look how miserable of a life that is. Paul says he's now made manifest by the appearing <clears throat> of our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, you know, when I look at this verse appearing, I also think about the appearing of, of Christ to Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus because it was a appearing, and in that appearing, it is a revelation that is then given to him about this concept here, right? This concept of this eternal purpose, which is given, the, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, not according to our works, but according to his grace, and that in, in Christ Jesus, he hath, notice this phrase, abolished death, Hold on, how do we abolish death? Aren't people still dying? Spiritual mindset, nobody's dying. Right. Spiritual mindset, nobody's dying. So as you read the verse here, he says, and hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I told you I'm always looking for interesting ways to present the gospel. What I mean by that is not the wisdom of words. I don't mean that at all. I not say... For a second, I'm trying to create wisdom of words. What I'm trying to do is how can I be a better persuader of the gospel more than Satan is? In other words, how can I prove to people that they're being deceived? In other words, how can I do that? How can I? So I ask them sometimes, hey, would you like immortality? To a, to a, super, to a person who's having a horrible time in their life, they may say, no, I don't want immortality. So I would say, okay, pick the best time in your life and you know, take away all the problems that you have. Would you then like immortality? And the answer is, you know, yes, they want that immortality. But it is brought to life in immortality. It is brought to light through what? This is where it comes to a head, okay? It's not guerrilla evangelism, if you would, but it's, it's, it's an important concept. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important, because we're going to get, hopefully today, we're going to get to the beginning of Romans chapter number nine, and you're going to go, oh, now I see what he's saying. Now I see why he has a great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. I get it. I see why. Because he has a, an appointment, another choosing, to be a... Preacher, I will tell you that every one of you who have believed the gospel are also appointed to be preachers of the gospel. But I'm not a preacher. <laughs> Sorry. You have to be a preacher of the gospel. How does that work? How, how, how does that happen? It's not a light switch you turn on and turn off. It's a constant understanding and appreciation that you live a life that is honest before all men. As Paul says, that we commend ourselves to every man's conscience and the sight of God, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, right? Not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, right? What do you do? You commend yourselves to every man's conscience and the sight. That's what I do. I just commend myself to the man's conscience. Listen, you, you know who I am. Let me tell you. You're not trying to, 
I've had people say one time, and, I, and I've told this story before, when I was at an office one day and I was working a project and it, something went really bad, and I was in the server room and I rattled off a couple choice words, and I came back up to the reception desk and I'm walking through something, and it was a pretty big deal, and the receptionist goes, man, I've never heard you say that before. And I kind of looked at her like this. She goes, I thought you were a good Christian. And I'm like, oops, you know, <laughs> oops. Right. Don't know what that means, but okay. Uh, and so then that was the opportunity to commend yourself to every man's conscience and to say, God, say, listen, I'm not a good Christian. There's no such thing as a good Christian, okay? I'm a sinful man saved by the grace of God. And then you have that opportunity. And you'll watch people very quickly go, huh, because what do you do? You own up to it very quick. And you go, yeah, that's my flesh, absolutely. Yeah, and thank God for his forgiveness. And they kind of look at you real weird, like, you didn't make an excuse. You, that wasn't really an excuse. You kind of just owned up to it and moved forward. So when we commend every man's, to ourselves in every man's sight the, and the conscience, we do it because we have an obligation as a preacher. Paul has a further obligation to be an apostle and ultimately, as he says here, a teacher of the Gentiles. Going back to Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> now that we see that verse, I want to just kind of read this and get to these other verses. He says, for whom he did foreknow... So, of course, you had an eternal purpose before the world began. He, he, he knew who was in Christ Jesus. He had a plan for those that were in Christ Jesus. He says, Don't, those he did foreknow, clearly he did predestinate them to be conformed to the image of his son. And people like to use this. Yes, to be conformed to his image of his son means that you will be a very good person, free of any and all sin, and you will be very obedient in your life. That's not what he means. Okay? The concept here and what he's getting to, to be predestinated, to be conformed to the image of his son, is what? It's the future hope. It's what we are waiting for. Is anybody really conformed right now to the image of his son? We got that flesh. It's still there, right? It still exists. But in God's eyes, we are already predestinated. We are already conformed to the image. So if you start thinking, th this is what I'm trying to get to, is stop thinking about your old man the way he is. He's always going to be that way. Focus on who the new man or the new woman is in Christ Jesus. And what I mean is this here, to be conformed to the image of his son, is this. We are waiting for, as he says in verse 18, for the glory which shall be revealed in us. That is not something that will happen while we are on this earth. People will teach that. They will say, you will have the glory revealed in you right now in the sense that this, that you'll be perfect and sinless without any violation of anything. No, you still have the flesh. That, that's going to be over there. We are waiting, as he says here, the glory which shall be revealed in us, which as he writes in verse number 21, which is the deliverance from the bondage of corruption, which is our flesh, this house of corruption. We're waiting to be delivered from it. I don't like it. My back hurts. I'm 35. Why does my back hurt so bad being 35? I want to know. It, it's every day. I went for an hour and 15 minute massage the other day, yesterday, and the lady says to me, did you sleep on your neck wrong? I said, no. Your really, back is really, really, really tight. I'm like, I don't know. She says, do you exercise a lot? I'm like, not really. I mean, maybe that's my problem, but I don't know. Either way, I'm waiting, as he says here, for the glorious liberty being delivered, the glorious liberty of the children of God, which as he writes in verse number 23, which we, we have this first fruits of the spirit, we are waiting for the adoption, in other words, to wit or to witness the redemption of our body. I watched a very good sermon the other day by Billy Graham. Surprising, I know. But it was a really good sermon, very short, but he was doing an evangelistic thing on the body. And he talks about the body and the soul. And he says, you know that you are eternal. And I was like, man, that's really good. You do know you're eternal. The people know that they exist for eternity. You look at your body, it fades away. Your soul, and he just kind of gives him the look. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. It's good. Stimulate that thought in the person's mind about that they are eternal. We know here, as he says here, that the whole creation is groaning. They are travailing in pain together until now. Not only they as in the world, but we ourselves also. We groan in a little bit different manner. See, the world system, what are they groan for? Oh, my, my, I don't, they have no hope. They're just groaning. They're travailing in the life without hope, without any future. 
And no creature would do that, as he says here, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. Nobody would willfully want to do that, right? But God did it. He has subjected us for the same in hope. The whole purpose of the creation was that we would have that hope. Because as this verse says, we are saved by hope. So when you put your head on the pillow at the end of the night, and you wake up in the morning, and man, I don't really want to get out of bed today. Why are you doing the things that you do? Where is the purpose? Do you have an eternal purpose? Are you looking for just for, oh, just another day. I've got to go do this work I don't like doing. Okay, well, so do we all, right? So I'm just doing it in a little bit different ways. But your focus, your mindset should be on this hope because, as he says here, we are saved by that hope. We are delivered by that hope. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why doth he, doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience. What do we do? We have to wait for it. And unfortunately, in our very, very uh, seeker ment mentality, church mentality, they want everything now. They want to experience everything. They want instant gratification. There is no patience. Patience is something that is taught because patience only comes from experience. And as we're going to read here, and just a second in the book of Joshua, I'm going to have you turn just a second. We're going to read that those scriptures as we've read, it's so important. They're not just there. Oh, that's the Old Testament. Know some good stuff. No, the scriptures that are written before time are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Just patience and comfort. How are you going to find comfort? Let me give you, let's go, let's go to this verse. And I want to show you this today. Look at the book of uh, Joshua with me, okay? <clears throat> go to Joshua. Go to chapter number five. And you remember a little bit about Joshua uh, after the death of Moses. Moses is, is dead. Joshua comes up to take over. And uh, they use those really cool verses like be strong and have a good courage, right? Uh, those phrases that you know in the beginning of, of Joshua, Joshua 1 9, right? Have I not commanded thee to be strong, have a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And so clearly he is going to take over the area that was the inheritance of them, the promised land. You have the story of Rahab and the, and the spies. You have the passage into Jordan. And then you eventually get to the issue where they're getting ready for battle because they're all overwhelmed. And you see this verse in verse number 13, which I really love. And it reads like this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Now, I don't know about you, but if you ever run into somebody with a sword drawn against his hand, the question that you're going to want to ask yourself is what? Uh, am I going to make it out of this? <laughs> is this guy a foe or a friend? Right? In other words, that's what he says. And Joshua went unto him and said, notice this, art thou for us or for our adversaries? Art thou, art thou for us or for our adversaries? If you ever travel to a foreign country... Uh, especially like South America or like even Mexico. Uh, it's really interesting because the military presence is like so much more. And there's sometimes guys just with guns and you're like, is that guy like is he a military guy? Is he a policeman? Whatever it is. And I remember going to even just in Mexico City, uh, like the actual downtown Mexico City, I had to go to an ATM. And there's a guy, like the private security guy who's got his gun on his back. Another guy with like two shotguns on either side of him like, you know, like this. I'm like, this is, this is unbelievable just to go get an ATM, right? But I kind of the whole time thinking to myself, I'm like, don't like tourists get killed here too? I was thinking, is this guy actually for me? Is he going to kill me? I don't know. I mean, maybe this guy's a bank robber. They don't have any like uniforms on. They're just, just standing there in front of the bank. But thinking about people who are for you or against us, every day we have a desire to, to really thrive or to live, right? It's, it's built into us. It's our, it's our, it's our instinct. From a spiritual perspective, the instinct should be, well, how, how do we survive or thrive in the spiritual sense? In other words, how do we know in the spiritual sense that God actually is for us? 
Well, partially these verses back here, I want to just read them for a second. They're teaching you a lesson. The lesson that we're learning here is, is not the general historical context of what happened with Joshua. It's, it's a bigger picture. We have these, uh, you know, Christology. We have, you know, the, the concept of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, correct? We see it all the time. We see all these examples of it over and over. And I could go, how, how is Moses an example of Jesus? Well, that's 25 sermons. How is, an ex- how is Joseph an example of Jesus, right? And now all those pictures come back to teach you about who Jesus is as the ultimate reconciliator. But in this passage here, he says, notice this. And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Now, Joshua was picked as being the leader, okay? He's the top dog. Some guy now comes up and says he is the host, the captain of the host of the Lord. He has now come. And I like how it says Joshua fell on his face to the earth. When do people fall on their face to the earth? Whenever they see God, right? Whenever they know that there's an authority above them. You read on, it says, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Same thing, remember Moses and the burning bush? Same generalized concept here, okay? So who did he see? I don't know. You know, an angel? A, a, you know, whatever, a vision of some sorts, right? But what he, did, what he did see and what he did appreciate is that the truth is that if God be for him, Who can be against him? Go back to the book of Romans in chapter number 8. And this is what Paul says here. He says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Seriously, I want you to answer that question. Who can be against you? What can be against you? Bring it up. Give me an option. Because there is none. Because he's already showed you that he has a purpose that so supersedes Anything that the world system can do. In other words, he says it three times in the scripture, I believe. He uses the phrase that God is all in all. Does that make sense? I think he says in Ephesians 1 and two times in the book of Corinthians. He is all in all. Yeah. So even when you think, I don't like God. "Ah, I don't like to retain God in my knowledge. That's, That's your prerogative. You can do that. But guess what you can't do? You can't remove God from you. Because he created you and he made you. And he has a purpose for you. And hopefully you see that purpose as being the ultimate high calling, as Paul talks of. So he says, if if God be for us, who can be against us? The next question, as he says here, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. That verse demonstrates that what the cross accomplished can never be undermined, can never be added to, can never be removed by anything the human man can do. In other words, he says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. In other words, the payment that God requires, right, is the payment that he provides. Believe it? To a lordship salvationist, they would say, no, no, no. I mean, yes, I believe that, but it's not that easy. You also must go through the list of things that you're going to do to ultimately please God. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not? That's the question. It's the negative question. How shall he not? We, we've already answered the question about how he has done so. Does that make sense? Do you follow me? He's already answered how he, how he has given you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's already answered how he's justified you freely by his grace through the redemption as in Christ Jesus. He already told you that he's given you the earnest of the inheritance. He's already told you that he's, he's given you the, the hope of the promise of the adoption of your bodies. So what then are you looking for? Well, what about my sin? Well, he's already told you that you are freed from sin, that he's forgiven you all trespasses. But what about, and you just go on this list of all these things, right? This is what's really important because this is what the human mind does. They try to find justification reasons why they can't believe this. This is impossible to believe because it's just so ridiculous. 
Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, it is not reasonable to believe this. Because it doesn't have to be reasonable. You know what reasonable is? Reasonable is what a reasonable man would believe about a certain situation. And a reasonable man would not believe this because that's what the world believes. A reasonable man is based upon the reasonable man text. And that's, a, that's some fictitious man that exists who's basically the world. And they would go no way. But I will tell you, it's very logical. This is very logical. It doesn't have to be reasonable, but it's very logical. And when you read the verse and he says here, how shall he not? The onus and the burden is on the world system to answer why you're not going to believe. Why you are not going to accept. It's on the religious leaders to say how he's not going to give us, freely give us all things. Free is a word that I've always been told to be careful of, right? <clears throat> You're growing up, free. Mm. Some people go, free, it's for me. My dad used to always say, listen, if it's free, you're the product being sold. You better be careful with it. It's probably, you know, free implies that quality is going to be poor. Who knows what this is going to be? There's somebody out to get you. There's no free lunch, right? But then all of a sudden, you're told that the gospel is free. That, that, the, that the grace of God is, is free. And you go, huh, that's a little interesting. But if God says it, where's the argument? It's your own argument. It's, your, it's in your own mind. So he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not? Again, the burden is on the world. How shall he not freely give us? And notice what he says here. <clears throat> all things. Now, I could preach you a sermon on this right now. It'd be a funny one. I could preach you the Joel Osteen version of what this would be. Or, or any other version of some prosperity Who? gospel teacher. You could see. Who? The Joel Osteen version. <laughs> not, not good. Who? Yeah. Hopefully you don't know him. But, but again, using the scripture in this context, we would know that he freely gives us all things does not mean that he's going to freely give you the new Ferrari that you really want or the new waterfront mansion or whatever other thing that you desire from a fleshly carnal perspective. What he is going to freely give us is all things that the cross of Christ accomplished. Does that make sense? How is he not going to freely give you everything that this accomplished? That's what he means by that. Doesn't mean he give you all things like, oh yeah, you're getting the car, you got a car. Isn't that Oprah? You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. Right? The world would love that. You know what? They'd like a car over eternal life until the car breaks down. You know? It's true. If you said you get a free car or you get eternal life, they're probably going to pick the car. Freely give us all things. It's freely through what he has done, all things, that that accomplished. This next verse where he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That is everything that is everybody and anyone that is in Christ. The charge means that what is, what is left to be paid? I just went to Wawa the other day. I go there, not even kidding you, three, four times a week. I go on the boat. I buy a sandwich. I buy some stuff. I'm there all the time. Everybody knows me in there, okay? <clears throat> I go in. I, I get $25 worth of stuff. I get drinks. I get some water. I get a bag of ice. I get all the things, and I stick my card in there, and I pay pull the card out, stick it in my pocket. I walk up. This is 530 in the morning. I walk up. I stick my little ticket to, for my sandwich in the little basket. I grab my sandwich. I stick it in there, get my ice, and I walk out. Do it. I've done it hundreds of times. Walk out. My other buddy is in there finishing getting his stuff. You know, he got a milkshake or something. took a little longer. He comes out. I'm putting the ice in the boat. He goes, yo, did you, uh, did you pay for that sandwich? And I looked at him like, yeah. And he goes, oh, they're in there saying you didn't pay. They didn't call the cops. And I'm like, hold on. I'm in there like all the time. I, I, no, I, I definitely paid for my sandwich. I have the receipt right here. You know? And he's like, I go in there and double check it. They were not happy. So I walked in and they were angry. And the girl was like, yeah, you didn't pay for that. I'm like, listen, listen, I'm in here like a ton of, luckily the manager lady no, knew me and she's like, no, no, he's, he's fine. He always pays for his stuff. He's never had an issue. Cause I guess I get a lot of theft and people coming in. But I felt really like weird, like, what, what, what do you mean you take, you know, like this is, I, I owed you something? I didn't owe you anything because I don't like owing anybody anything. Paul says owe no man anything, right? <laughs> right? So I look at it from the perspective of when you look at the charge of God's elect, what is it that is left to be paid? Again, the onus is on you. So how shall he not freely? What was left to be paid 
through the cross. I mean, answer that question. I've asked that to Calvinists all the time. If you're telling me, if you're telling me that you have to persevere to the end in order to be saved, which is what they say, which that verse has nothing to do with persevering to the end in terms of obtaining eternal life. It's, uh, it's, it's not having to experience death in the physical sense because you get to actually physically walk in the kingdom, but that's another whole other story. But again, the concept of charge, is there something that is still owed between you and God? I can tell you right now that I owe God nothing. Nothing. That we have a clean account. You know, they talk about the short account system with God. You heard that one? Oh man, I hate that too. What a way of living. The short account system with God is that every time you sin, you got to start confessing those sins. And you're like, oh man, I don't like this. this is, we're, we're, what are we doing here? And you're just, what are you focusing on all the time? You're losing the, you're losing the battle is what you're losing. No, absolutely. Absolutely. 100% agreed. Because ultimately, if you read right here, this is what's really important. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Because if you read this next verse, this, is, this next part, it is God that justifieth. That's a big thing. Because you know what the world, even the religious systems believe, they believe that they're participating, they're not going to tell you this, but they're participating in their justification. Oh, yeah, because, you know, I, I, I had to do this, you know. God just plants that little seed in you, and it's up to you to take that little seed and then hold on to it the whole entire time. Wait, what? I've heard that. I've heard them tell you that unless you, that, you know, God gives you this little plan of eternal life, you better hold on to it to the very end. If you don't want it to the very end, you can lose it. Oh, I squandered it. I lost it. And you're like, this is, this is bizarre. Bizarre. Because it is God that justifies. He's already told you in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 26 that he is just and the justifier. And the only way he can be just is when he provides the just payment, which is himself. And he's the justifier of him, which believeth in Jesus. People ask all the time, why then do you have to have the crucifixion? It's this bloody mess. How is this hard? Okay. The reason why you had to have a crucifixion is very simple. Ready? It's because it demonstrates just how sinful you really are. And the, and the consequences for your action, which is death. How is that hard? How is it hard to see? And what he does is through his death, he conquers death. I don't have a problem with it. Anyways, the next question he asks is, who is he that condemneth? Well, to most people, they condemn themselves, right? And they sit there and, oh, I'm just condemning myself. God's not condemning you. If you're in Christ Jesus, you cannot be condemned. It's not possible. So if you go, well, today I feel like I'm condemned. Well, guess what? Stop feeling that way because it's not true. You go, but that's, it's, just, it's easier said than done. It's called believing the word of God. Let me, give, let me give you another example. Paul says to cast down, I use this verse all the time, I hope you have it memorized, cast down every imagination. See, the imagination is very strong. It's always the battle for the mind. So you're casting down the imagination that somehow, as you read here, that you're getting condemned, that somehow God is not for you, that somehow he did not give us all things. Right? Okay. It's your own little logic in your own brain. Stop. Read the verse. Believe it. He, he, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Go, again, go back to that. He, who is he that condemneth? Remember the verses in John 3 where he's talking to Nicodemus? Like John 3, 17, John 3, 19, John 3, 15, John 3, 16. He's talking about the condemnation of the world, right? That the world is already condemned already. So from this condemnation perspective is who is he that condemneth? He just stops you right there. He goes, well, stop with the condemnation because we're not even talking about that. Go back to what I already told you, which is it is Christ that died. Why are you going back to condemning yourself when you're not the one that died? It's Christ that died. So what's the problem? Yeah, if you had to die for your own sin, you would be dead in your trespasses. You would pay for the wages of sin, which is death. But fortunately for you, Christ died in your stead. And guess what you get to do? Think about it not in his death, but think about it rather in his resurrection. Who is he that condemneth? Yea, that is risen. Not that Christ has died, but that he has risen, which is that proof and payment. He has risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And Russ and I were talking about that verse last week, about whether or not he sits up there and, and makes intercession. Let me just explain how this works, okay? This is how it works, ready? God, Jesus Christ. Just by Jesus Christ being in the presence of God, he makes intercession. <laughs> Got it? His presence demonstrates his intercession. Because his whole entire existence, he lives to make intercession. He's not going, oh, God, <clears throat> uh, Jason did that thing again. <clears throat> just, just don't remember me. No, he just sits there and he knows. Does that make sense? He's not like, oh, and that sin too, God. Don't, don't hurt him for that one. No, just because of the presence of Christ there, it's demonstrative that he has forgiven all men. 
you read this verse here and he says he is also he also maketh intercession for us in particular he's making it only for us but it is important to note that he does want the world to believe his desire as we read there in second timothy chapter one is for the world to believe that gospel message they want he wants that world to be saved so as we get into verse 35 and we have to stop here he says who shall separate us from the love of christ you should already be answering this question and he's going to go, well, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We will talk about that next week. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In verse 38 is what you need to do in your own life. Application. Ready for the application? For I am persuaded. Are you persuaded? Yes. You should be persuaded. Every day, you're persuading yourself of the truth of the scripture. He says, I'm persuaded that neither death... Well, listen, it's pretty easy to persuade it for Paul, because listen... A, he saw Christ on the road to Damascus. Okay. Um, he was stoned at Lystra. He died. Okay. I think if after I died, saw Christ, saw the third heaven, I'd be like, wow. This life? Who cares? Let's do whatever we got to do to get it done. And that is a degree of his boldness that he does have toward the gospel. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, what is anxiety? Projecting your current self into a future situation. Right? Uh, right? That's anxiety. Projecting your, your current self into a future situation. And what do you do with that? Well, that situation hasn't even occurred yet. <laughs> it's just a waste of time. So Paul says that nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, and I think that's a very important verse, nor any other creature is super important, because we could talk about anything that God has created is able, anything, the creature means anything, that even includes the angels, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Next week, I want to talk a little bit about this verse, that they were killed all the day long. I want to talk about some of Paul's own issues in his life where he was persuaded even more of the, of the truth of that death, or nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. And that ultimately, I want to get to verse nine, chapter 9, where he spends a lot of time talking about this great heaviness and continual sorrow that he has in his heart. How could you have great heaviness and continual sorrow when you just read all of these wonderful verses about Romans 8 and it is the truth that not everybody has that same peace. So Paul's desire is he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. He wants to also be, as he says, I wish myself also could be accursed from Christ. That's a degree of love that you have for a person for their soul, right? Because I'm going to tell you right now, every one of you here today, or even me, are here today because somebody told you the gospel. Okay? So think about that. Let's close in a prayer.